You're listening to Florida Capital Conversations, a podcast series brought to you by Holland and Knight's Tallahassee office. Each episode of this series will take a look at the many different aspects of state and local government through the lens of our experienced legal professionals. Our hosts, Nate Adams and Mia McCown, have a wide range of Florida governmental experience and offer a seat at the table to everyone who listens to these candid conversations. Welcome to our Florida Capital Conversations podcast series. Today, our subject is antitrust law, and our guest is Kevin Cox. My name is Nathan Adams. My co-host is Mia McCallan. There is none better than Kevin Cox to kick off our discussion on antitrust. Mia, let me uh, turn to you to ask our first question. Kevin, thanks so much for joining Nate and I today to talk about antitrust, which is pretty complicated and a lot of the nuances and the things that go into it, but could you give our listeners just a little bit of an idea of what antitrust is just and give us a framework from that and then we'll move on to some of our other questions. But I think it's important to kind of give a little bit of a education on what this involves and what the purpose of it is. Sure. And uh, thanks, Nate and me. It's good to talk with you all. I think that's a good question because antitrust can uh, be a little overwhelming when it gets into to a litigation phase. And there's a lots of people hear about experts and, and, and measures of uh, regression analyses and this and that defining markets. And, and, and it can be it can seem like it's more complicated than maybe it, it should be. It all boils down to one simple concept, competition. As a bedrock of our, our American system, our capitalist system, the idea is that competition is the best way to get the most efficient results, the best prices, the best quality of service, that if you preserve competition, then you're going to get the American way. And so what sometimes happens, and it, it happens in historic businesses as well as modern businesses, is that sometimes there are things that happen that get in the way of competition. They are anti-competitive. And it could be because uh, competitors join together to uh, fix prices or to agree to uh, allocate markets or to do anything that would basically disrupt what is a competitive marketplace. And so the bottom line is, Antitrust laws, both at the federal level and the state level, are designed to preserve competition because that's what's going to lead to the best results for, for, for everybody, for consumers, suppliers, everybody in our economic system if there is, is competition. And so there's a lot of cases that have developed the law regarding what is and what is not anti-competitive. And that's what makes antitrust law such an interesting arena because it is constantly evolving but it is constantly also focused on a really core principle that, that makes this country a great country, which is that we, we, we have a free market and we want to have competition to get to the best results. The idea in that just is that by in- encouraging competition, it supports innovation companies to be innovative, that they're competitive with their prices, all the things that in the end will benefit the end, the end user, the consumer, um, and protects them to have those type of things. That's exactly it. If you Imagine if you only have two competitors out there and they're cooperating with each other and planning together, uh, you're not necessarily going to get the best results. You're not going to necessarily get the best prices or the best service because they know they, that there's no other provider in town. The same would be true of a monopolist. If there's only, if there's only one provider then uh, you don't have a lot of competition and there's not a lot of incentive for them to, to make sure that their prices are, are, are the best and their service is the best. And so uh, bringing in competition, avoiding monopolies, avoiding competitors, you know, working together basically is exactly what you said. It's going to help the consumer in the end. Kevin, my understanding of American history a little bit is that antitrust law is actually one area uh, of particular contribution by, by American law. Um, in, in the common law through statutory law and the like. And that, you know, it, it has a history dating back to maybe most prevalent enforcement was during the Teddy Roosevelt years when steel was a big issue and, and you know, antitrust monopolies in hard industry. If you were to think about how antitrust law has evolved now in, into 2022, where do we see it employed the most? I, you know, we hear in, in, in on radio and television about big tech and, and sort of issues there, but 
Am I correct that you know healthcare is another area that we're, we see a lot of antitrust issues? And I'm just curious from your standpoint, you know, when you see enforcement activity today, what are some of the most common areas where antitrust law is at issue? Sure. And you're right that sometimes when we think of the antitrust context, we, we think of things like the Sherman Antitrust Act and Teddy Roosevelt, the Trust Buster and the, and, and the, and the Clayton Act. And these are things that are like 100 years or more old. And we think about steel and, and these big old industries from the Gilded Age. And when you had a lot of economic power concentrated in a few hands, and, and you can see why in those, in those types of industries at that time, with the concentration of economic might that would be shared by in only a few hands or monopolists, it's sort of obvious based on the kind of things we already talked about of, of, of the dangers of uh, these, these trusts and how that could affect consumers. But as you point out, you know, the, the most powerful uh, economic interests evolve over time. They change over time. The way that products and, are packaged and delivered and, and services are packaged and delivered has changed over time. And it's not as if antitrust concepts go away. Antitrust concepts still routinely apply as, as these industries evolve. And as you know, I, I don't know how complicated healthcare was at the time of Teddy Roosevelt, but it's extremely complicated now with lots of different partnerships and alignments and things that, that are, are really, I, th I'm, I know, designed to uh, facilitate great delivery of care, but can be extremely complicated. And, and I think antitrust law has had to catch up with that. And, and, and there's always a great, you know, and if you're in the healthcare industry, I think it's it's always worth being very mindful of what is going on in the antitrust enforcement arena, as well as in the the civil litigation, because there there are there are unforeseen traps that you might, that you might fall into as a healthcare provider. I think you I think there's a lot of of activity in in the healthcare arena. You also mentioned big tech and and some of the you know emerging technologies, and and that's another one where obviously that didn't exist at all in Teddy Roosevelt's time, but those are some of the one of the great industries of today. That's that might be the steel industry of today, and it's it's rapidly evolving, just like some of those early industries were evolving. And they have an enormous um, influence in our lives and, and in every every person's everyday life. And they, they there's a lot of complicated alignments and, and, and obviously sharing. Sometimes there's information shared, sometimes not. And whenever you've got potential competitors who are uh, sharing information, whether it's in, in healthcare or in data services or in any industry, and in our economic lives and the economic lives of our leading corporations are not becoming simpler due to technology. They are proliferating in complexity, globalization, and the number of you know, partners that are able to work together fairly seamlessly because of technology and because of the information that is out there. Uh, it actually creates a, 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 an, an even more fertile and active environment for potential problems, uh, may, maybe unforeseen, maybe intended. But that is, I know that if, if, particularly if you are in those types of industries, you should be as mindful as ever. We see now, just in the last few years, is some, some of the most active enforcement going on by, by the government in terms of looking at these types of industries and, and really trying to figure out where is the line for, to, to, to regulate. Obviously, you don't want to enforce against innovation. You don't want to enforce against some of the creative things that they're doing that may be very beneficial and pro-competitive for consumers. But you don't want any abuse uh, based on the amount of power that they have economically. Uh, and, and it's what is a monopoly in terms of, of, of data, in terms of, you know, uh, what is the market when you're talking about, you know, data platforms and social media platforms? It's, it's, it, it, asks, it raises a whole series of new questions that all go back to those same principles that we talked about before. And it varies, too. I mean, antitrust, depending on, frankly, which political party is in power. It seems like the Biden administration has been a lot more aggressive in the FTC approving mergers or what they're looking at. So that, that also shifts into what priorities are and the direction that they want to go. It's, I mean, that's what it seems like in, in my experience. Is, would you agree with that? You do see the influence of, of whatever political administration, both, both in terms of legislation, and we're seeing more legislation these days at, at the congressional level being proposed. We're also seeing uh, you know, the DOJ and the FTC have taken a, a slightly different position than, than what we saw before. And like I said, it's been very, very active these days. 
but I think there are also, it's interesting, there are also opportunities for, for sort of things that maybe there's going to be a bipartisan ap- ap- approach on certain of these issues, you know, protecting people and that, you know, when there's, when there's privacy issues out there. So, so I think what you're describing me is exactly right. And it's a little unpredictable in terms, of it, it is dynamic. It changes what, what the definition of, you know, what's over the line can change depending on the, the political will, who's in office and those sorts of things. Although there are some fundamental principles that, that I think will always be agreed upon. It's very unpredictable. And then, of course, you have the courts and what are the courts going to do and what are the courts are going to going to say? I think we've seen the courts taking stronger positions in, in, in certain regards against, uh, for instance, state action immunity is the, the courts have cut back further on that just in the last few years. And and, and, and issues like this, that that every time they evolve slightly, everybody has to readjust and figure out, OK, how does that affect my planning? How does that affect my 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 risk mitigation strategy? And uh, how does that make, you know, inform me about the best way to innovate, to grow, to have a very successful business, while also at the same time making sure that I'm not running afoul of, of, of something that someone might call anti-competitive? So, Kevin, some of our listeners may have read books like Upton Sinclair's The Jungle or, you know, books from that era where they have in their head uh, the idea of a bunch of people sitting around in a room smoking cigars, divvying up the country's markets and deciding what, you know, what ought to be the price for, for goods. But am I correct that there's a lot of companies that get caught in antitrust that, that you know, there, there was never any intentional conduct here in, in terms of, you know, conspiracy to, to set pricing and that kind of thing. And so what about those companies that that may not realize that they're in the crosshairs of antitrust law, you know, because they their understanding of what antitrust is all about may be somewhat dissimilar from from the way it's actually typically happens. That's a great point. And it's not always an obvious monopolist. It's not always a competitor sitting back in a smoke filled room sort of making these intentionally conspiratorial deals. It's it's actually Quite the opposite, I think, in the sense that the company should be careful anytime, anytime, no matter what, how good its intentions are about sharing information that could provide an advantage you know, within a small group of competitors. That includes not just the prices that they're going to charge, but what they're going to pay their employees. Uh, any, anything that has a competitive, potentially a competitive benefit that if it's shared within a few competitors and, and, and the folks that are left out are, are going to be at a disadvantage. I mean, this could be, this could be a problem. And whoever, whoever is hurt by this may raise a claim. And, and that's, that's something that is oftentimes not foreseen by the entities involved. I mean, I think, too, about examples of, of, of trade associations, which are wonderfully pro-competitive uh, and do wonderful things. And when I say pro-competitive, I mean, they are good for consumers. I mean, they, they help establish better standards for services and, and, and products. They help make each other more efficient by by talking about what is, is and they help advance the industry at the same time they have to be very careful and i know associations are very careful about not sharing information that's going to be competitively sensitive and that's going to basically allow them to uh not have to compete as hard because they know uh certain things about their competitors and so that's that's a great example uh, and nate i think this is kind of what you're getting to is that there are an example of an association or an example of just competitors are kind of watching, maybe discussing, not with any intent to, because they happen to be in the same industry. They, the same business is very important to all of them. They have to be very careful that the type of information that they share, the type of discussions that they have are not, at, at bottom, unintentionally proving to be anti-competitive. And, and Kevin, is that to a certain extent what you're talking about in that regard? I remember reading something, I want to say at the end of the year of 2021, I don't know if it was a congressional report or something where we, we talked about the tech issues, right? That there was a, an interest in that. But also, I think there was some concern about pharmaceutical pricing. Is that kind of another area where they're ebbing and flowing and we don't know, you know, we've got to see where they're going. I don't know. I, I want to say it was a It was like a congressional report that they had some serious concerns about pharmaceutical industry pricing and business practice. Have you seen any activity in that regard? Well, I think in in terms of, and we talked about healthcare a little, touched on healthcare a little bit before. Healthcare is in its portion of the economy and the portion of, of our, the money that flows through, whether it be healthcare services, whether it be pharmaceutical 
it's going it has become you know a dramatic part of our economy and you're right there is increased tension not only because of the it, the, the scale of it but also because of the you know the the complexity of of the relationships between pharmaceuticals and other uh, between each other between the providers between all of the various components of the supply chain and given the amount that some people pay for medication and that that purchasers whether whatever the entity be may be including insurers obviously there's going to be and there will continue to be a very close eye on how those prices are being dictated is there something in, in there that you know prices are artificially inflated that 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 folks obviously for consumers this is a big deal not not just because it's a price but because this is a price to take care of yourself and so i think you're going to see i think you're right mia that there has been increased attention on that and there i i don't think that's going to go away i think that's going to continue to be a significant focus both in the pharmaceutical industry as well as well as in healthcare more broadly kevin tell us a little bit about sort of what what it is if let's say you're a company you're you're concerned whether you're in compliance with antitrust law. What are the kinds of things that that you do in this antitrust practice to to explain to the average consumer, you know, how you how the firm might be helpful to them? Sure. Well, I, I think for one, if you should have someone who is aware of these kinds of issues, uh, whether it be in, in internal legal counsel or outside counsel, who can understand what you're doing as a business and see things that may not be immediately obvious to you. When we counsel clients, we, we walk through sort of the, the, the most obvious traps in terms of the way that they communicate with their competitors, the way that they look at pricing, look at the agreements they have with partners, and just see sometimes spot things that, that aren't, aren't immediately obvious. Because Again, a lot of these folks, if if not a hundred, not all the ones, are are doing everything based on trying to accomplish something good for the, for their customers and their business. Sometimes those those steps just are things that courts have found to be not quite in line with the antitrust laws, or 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 close to the edge. And so before before going too far down those roads, particularly when you are communicating with competitors. And partners can sometimes or oftentimes be competitors, particularly if you're involved in associations, uh, particularly if you are a company that is thinking about a creative new kind of coalition to, to, to deliver your services or to produce your services and products. Oftentimes, it makes sense just to do a sanity check. And this is the kind of work we do quite often to, to counsel, just to, just to have someone read over it. Not only for the basic contractual, you know, risks mitigation, but from specifically from an antitrust perspective, because those issues don't—they're just not as immediately apparent unless you spend some time in this area. And so that's that's what I would recommend to any company, um, especially these days, as uh, you know, if we talked about the enforcement has it seems to be perking up, and that will that will lead to a, to a, a you know, some redefinitions and some increased activity probably on the civil side as well. Nate, one of the things that Kevin and I experience just with clients when they're working on deals, just even how they're communicating with each other about the deal, what they're saying, they need to be mindful that all of their emails, everything that they say at some point could come under scrutiny. So there's a lot of complicated things, right, that that go with it with all the things that are antitrust, but still at the end of the day, the email traffic, the communication back and forth, um, even though it may not be what you meant, it could be interpreted very differently. Right, Kevin? We've seen that in cases that we've had. And so those would be some things that I would, in, you know, if we were encouraging folks, that's one area that I would remind them about. If, and, and that sounds really simple, but it can really come back and hurt the company when there was really no ill intent if something is interpreted the wrong way. That's right. Now, I would keep in mind that competition is good for consumers and competition is good. If you're a company, you should want competition. That that should be your goal. And and, and if someone were to read your internal memoranda uh, about what you were trying to do and your objectives, it should be apparent that you were trying to, you know, compete fairly. You know, I know that's that's going to be what's what's the best, but sometimes things are misinterpreted. And so you want to make sure that, that everybody's on the same page uh, with your with your organization, and and that's something that you know sometimes a steady reminder is can all can always be helpful. 
All right. Well, I want to thank Kevin Cox for this informative and interesting discussion about antitrust law. And I want to thank my co-host, Mia McCowan. Mia, you, uh, I know, also do a fair amount in this antitrust area. So it's a pleasure to have you on this podcast in particular. And most of all, I want to thank uh, all of those listening for joining us today. Please plan to join us for our next Florida Capital Conversations podcast. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to Florida Capital Conversations. For more information on our Tallahassee office, please visit hklaw.com slash Tallahassee.